welcome to Orinoco Tribune's uh, special episode with uh, Beirut-based political analyst and journalist, Leit Marouf. So he will be, of course, he will be talking about whatever is happening in Lebanon, Gaza, other parts of Palestine, West Asia in general, and of course, the geopolitical impact of that. So it has been almost a year since the start of the Al-Aqsa flood. During this time, the Palestinian people have lived between two realities. I'm saying, paraphrasing the Hamas leader, Yahya Sinwar, that reality of horrific genocide and of exceptional resilience. Since October 8, 2023, the Zionist entity has unleashed a real genocide in Gaza, taking over 40,000 lives and injuring close to 100,000 people, with almost 70% of the dead and the wounded being women and children. So occupation war plans have bombarded schools, hospitals, churches, mosques. They have disappeared entire residential areas in Gaza City and in other urban centers of the Gaza Strip and has announced an ethnic cleansing plot as a final solution to the Palestinian question. While the United States and its allies, as usual, defend the Zionist entities right to defend itself and even its right to exist and are sending weapons and warships to the settler colonial state. The axis of resistance in West Asia has announced moral and material support for Palestinians, potentially turning the Palestine situation into a global battlefield. And among this axis of resistant members, Lebanon features prominently with Hezbollah accompanying its Palestinian counterparts since day one of Al-Aqsa flood. Consequently, throughout this period, Lebanon has been as much a target of the Zionist entity as Gaza. In this situation, Orinoco Tribune considers it essential to look at various aspects of the Palestinian cause and the Palestinian resistance, the situation in the broader region in general, and what this implies for anti-imperialists globally. So in order to discuss this event, as I already mentioned, we are joined by Light Marouf, directly from Beirut, which is currently being bombed. So thanks a lot for coming, and I mean, despite this situation. So yeah, thanks a lot. Great to be with you. It's uh, my pleasure to be with Oranico Times. Okay, so um, I'll just start with the first one. And I mean, given the situation, I think we should start with the terrorist attack that happened yesterday and the day before yesterday in Lebanon, carried out through the explosions of uh, different kinds of electronic devices. So for me, and I think for many people around the world, this was like very terrifying because electronic devices are part of everyday life everywhere in the world, especially including now that we are to join. I mean, we are connected by some electronic devices. So how do you assess these attacks as in how did this come to pass? And what has been or could be as well as possible a reaction or retaliation to this massive, let's call electronic terrorism? Yeah, look, uh, this is definitely a new form of warfare that we haven't seen being uh, used before. And uh, even cyber warfare had its uh, red lines, its uh, rules of engagement. And uh, in fact, even, you know, there is UN resolutions about targeting uh, civilian electronics as on the books uh, defined as terrorism as war crime since the 70s uh, you can't even disguise a bomb let's say as a radio or whatever even before we talk about cell phones and pagers and walkie-talkies uh, so we are living a new age and i think uh, since the beginning of the genocide in gaza uh we have been living a new world and i heard a boom uh just now so i don't know what's what's the issue but um you know first off the actions uh, of uh, the palestinian resistance on october 7th the kind of strategies that they use the uh, bravery that they uh exhibited on that day and the uh, dominance of uh, the Zionist on that day, 12 of the main Israeli bases uh, that surround Gaza's concentration extermination camp that includes the most uh, 
formidable Israeli units were all defeated on that day. That ushered this new age that we are living. Everything from that moment on has changed. This is the significance of October 7th. And what we saw in uh, response to this groundbreaking action, uh, unheard of by any uh, people in an extermination camp, more brave than the Warsaw Ghetto uh, uprising, more brave than any other uprising in such a situation, more successful than any, that ushered uh, the new age of outright genocide that the whole West is uh, accepting. And now we can see from, if you follow this chain up to the uh, electronic cyber terrorism attack, you will see also that every step and every stage of this war that's almost one year old has included new uh, unexpected kinds of warfare and or breaches of, of law, international law by the enemy, successes uh, uh, by the axis of resistance and breaches and breaches and breaches of norms every stage by the Zionist uh, entity. And so uh, the day before the terrorist attack by the Zionists on Beirut on, 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 and Lebanon uh, on the electronic devices, Yemen sent in its hypersonic missile at Mach 10, the most impoverished nation in the world, uh, you know, destroyed the superiority of all the imperial air defenses and hit Tel Aviv, occupied Yaffa, and that was, uh, you know, another moment of this change on in the world that we live in. And here, the day after, we see how the Zionist response. The only responses that the Zionists have are more breaches of international law, more uh, direct, purposeful, unabashed, genocidal intent and actions. The Zionists wanted to blow up 3,000 pagers, meaning kill 3,000 human beings. And they wanted to blow up 2,000 walkie-talkies, meaning they wanted to kill another 2,000 human beings, at least all in a moment or two, as Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah said in his speech. They wanted to have this mass direct ethnic cleansing. And uh, the West has cheered it on. The Western media cheered on this genocidal action. They considered it the highest of uh, intelligence and uh, electronic uh, and military prowess and brilliance. Outright genocide. Tomorrow, if the Zionists put the Palestinian people in ovens and broadcasted live, the Western media would cheer it as the most successful action on battlefield. This is the age that we live in. And, uh, you know, this, you know, terrorist attack opened up now the floodgates. And as we see just hours ago, the Zionist uh, uh, an F-35 fired four missiles on a building of uh, seven floors hitting the uh, ground floor that includes businesses like a local, you know, corner store, grocery store, and so on, and uh, leveling the whole building in the Lahi of Beirut uh, on its inhabitants. Uh, there's at least uh, 12 martyred up until now, and uh, almost 60 people uh, that are injured. All the buildings around it are, are damaged, and there is uh, tens of people still under the ground, under the rubble. Uh, you know, seven floors collapsed on its, each other, and uh, there's at least four children martyred. This is 
We're not even talking about the pagers. I'm sorry, I'm rambling here because we are, the news is happening in the moment. And I think we are approaching the uh, breach of the floodgates. We are, the Zionists want a war with Lebanon and they want the Lebanese uh, resistance to accept that uh, new stage here. And the, you know, Hezbollah is trying its best to maintain the safety of the population of Lebanon, but I don't think we can stay out of this for much longer. As a follow-up to that, I think um, a lot of analysts and folks keep saying that, you know, the, the Israelis aren't stupid. Of course they won't go to war with Lebanon. And uh, what you're saying is that they want a war with Lebanon. Um, and of course the U.S., which is really behind all of this. Um, could you expand more on why you see that they want this war to happen despite the immense... Yeah, I mean, anyone that uh, looks at what the Zionist uh, colony's main uh, strategic goal, you see, there's uh, will understand what I'm talking about. So what is the main strategic goal of the Zionist colony, it is permanency to the colony, right? Uh, and what, you know, what is the strategic goal of the United States? It is uh, to remain as the hegemon, the only sole empire in this world. And now, so we can take this as a basic that anybody that reads uh, games theory can understand this is not like uh, uh, you know rocket science so if the zionists want to maintain their colony they have only two options one complete ethnic cleansing of the palestinians two is to uh, you know give uh, admit that there is a apartheid and have a one state solution and stay if they want to stay there. And what we see is clearly that Zionists do not want option two. They only want option one. Okay, there's no other third option. There's one or two, it's zero one game. Uh, and so once you understand that and you look at the the fact that before this war, demographically, Palestinians for the first time since the ethnic cleansing, the genocide of the Nakba happened for the first time since 1948, Palestinians became the majority within the historical land of Palestine. That meant it's over demographically. The colony is over demographically. It was already set in stone with or without this war of liberation that we're seeing right now. And so... The Zionists are choosing genocide. Similarly, the United States understands that the liberation of Palestine will lead to the fall of Sykes people. You understand that we, as in this region here, have been stuck in the moment of World War I. We're in an unresolved conflict of World War I, Sykes people. And the minute Palestine is liberated, there'll be millions of Palestinians in the refugee camps in Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, as well as millions of Arabs, Palestinians, you know, Syrians, Lebanese, Jordanians, Egyptians that are going to cross into Palestine. And there's nobody to bring them back. It is the end of Sykes Pico. And once Sykes Pico ends, and then the natural capitals of the Arabic world, the natural geographical capitals, Damascus, uh, Baghdad, Cairo, Sana'a, and Algiers, will return to being the center of power in the society. And all these fake uh, kingdoms that were manufactured by the British and uh, following the Americans, these glass towers in the, in the desert that were 
manufactured to create a new Arab hmm, that represents what a white man wants to be the Arab will return to their natural place, okay, which is non-existence in the political order. It is just the back waters of the Arabic world. It is the you know where population uh, moves out from into the the big capitals of the Arabic world. These cities, these glass cities in the middle of the desert, will not exist. All of this colonial order will collapse. The Zionists and the Americans will fight this till the last breath. This is not going to be a short war. Mm. Uh, you have you have mentioned this before also that so the fake borders will fall the, the way I mean the day Palestine is liberated the fake borders will fall and I mean I, I remember this thing so uh, and yeah I I am of the same opinion I mean it, it can be seen I mean anyone who wishes to see it can see that 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 is that will be the natural resolution natural development or e uh, evolution of this war. So um, let's now, but we will like, talk about Lebanon and the, the war that is currently happening because you said that you cannot, I mean, the people of Lebanon cannot be kept out of it forever or for longer. So that's exactly what I was going to ask about it, that it has started bombing. I mean, it started bombing yesterday, is bombing Beirut itself, the capital today, and is also like moving troops towards the border, I mean, to the north so that it can probably start a ground offensive. I mean, there has been the threat of that. So, uh, and of course, throughout the last year, Lebanon has been bombed many, many times, like time and time again. So how have these actions by the Zionist entity impacted the daily life of the people of Lebanon? I mean, it is already impacted by the economic decline and everything, but how has these war, war actions impacted the life of the people and what sort of impact that this has had on their view towards the Palestinian cause or supporting the Palestinian resistance in general? Yeah, there's been a huge uh, shift in population uh, opinions in Lebanon since the beginning of uh, the genocide in Gaza in two noticeable things. And uh, this is, um, on the one hand, there was decades of uh, Western imperial propaganda pumped into huge sectors of the Lebanese population to blame the Palestinian resistance for the civil war in the 1970s uh, and the destruction of uh, Lebanon at the hands of uh, the Zionists in the 1980s. Uh, and so you had this weight saying of, of in this populations, mainly the Christian and or some of the Sunni population that uh, didn't want uh, Lebanon to have anything with the liberation of Palestine because of this historical uh, animosity that was pumped in. Now today, the Lebanese people, no matter what their backgrounds are, have seen the Palestinian people fighting for their own liberation on their own land without uh, you know, bringing in any other country into it or using anybody else's territory to do this fight and have exhibited the uh, most resilience, most brilliant uh, resistance filmed every day, right? The courage of uh, the warriors in Gaza and in the West Bank. So we saw right now a shift a huge shift, and the actual, um, you know, uh, what are surveys that were done of the Lebanese population just in the last month and two, there was multiple surveys, showed to that uh, close to 75% of the population uh, supports the Palestinian people, is uh, against the genocide, uh, and, the, uh, you know, something like almost 70% of the population uh, saying that Hezbollah is acting in the most uh, rational way, that Hezbollah is uh, trying to protect the Lebanese population from the genocidal actions of the Zionist colony. So this means that 
the West and all its uh, regional uh, vassals in the Arabic world have been pumping hate and sectarianism inside Lebanon for 30 somewhat years have lost that huge investment of billions of dollars uh, uh, into this propaganda and are unable to affect uh, a possible internal conflict in Lebanon that could, let's say, harm the resistance and weaken its ability to support the Palestinian people. So this is part and parcel of why today Israel is in, uh, accelerating its direct attacks on Lebanon because it cannot, the West as a whole was unable to find a local militia, contra, vassal that could start something inside the country. There was not one peep of demonstrations against the resistance, no matter where uh, in, in this country, you know? So, uh, and the, the reaction of the people on, over the two days of uh, those cyber terrorist attacks uh, showed complete cohesion. All the hospitals in all the regions, no matter what sect uh, or, or religion they belong to, all the neighborhoods opened their, uh, their so much uh, people giving blood, historical amount of blood donations in all the regions. Uh, and uh, and to you know this shows you the actual uh, feelings on on the ground here in uh, Lebanon, and I think today is um, uh, Hezbollah. By the way, um, I, I don't know if you're going to ask about what has happened since uh, this uh, these attacks, but we can discuss it more. I think every, people are expecting Hezbollah to defend the country, and uh, thus responses are expected. Yeah, we um, the kind of the breaking down of sectarianism has been a massive, massive win, I think, for the Arab world, especially the sectarianism that was against Yemen, uh, but also internal within different groups, as you're saying, within uh, Lebanon, etc. And there's still a lot of sectarianism against the Syrian government, um, but that's still breaking down as well. Uh, so, and yesterday in his speech, I believe Said Asal mentioned the unity of Lebanon applauded everyone. Um, my kind of follow-up is because um, we know that war happens on multiple battlefields. So there's the battlefield with guns and bombs, there's the battlefield with you know mines and psychological warfare, etc., which we were just discussing. Um, something that I don't think a lot of the Western world hears about is the political situation and the weaponization of politics in Lebanon. Could you speak a little bit about like the role of Amos Hochstein? I think is his name. He's the, the U.S. mediator who keeps trying to put his face into Lebanon, um, and how what the U.S. and the Zionists are doing in regards to that situation. Yeah, Amos Hochstein, who uh, is an Israeli officer that served in the Israeli military. Uh, and is right now the special envoy of the United States, uh, representing the president directly, basically, than an existing uh, vegetable president uh, on negotiations with uh, Hezbollah. And, um, you know, every time he comes to the country, Hezbollah, just before he arrives or as he's in the country, uh, does a huge surprise. Uh, remember um, when he came to negotiate on behalf of the Zionist uh, a year, two years now, time is passing, uh, on behalf of the Zionists for the maritime borders. Hezbollah at that time uh, flew drones over the Israeli oil uh, and gas facilities in the Mediterranean showing that they can uh, sink those uh, facilities. And uh, of course, he crapped his pants and uh, gave Hezbollah what they needed. And similarly, Hezbollah has done that uh, every time he arrived, those two hoodhood videos uh, that flew over Haifa and um, the other one um, over uh, 
uh, I'm, I'm forgetting right now, the region in Palestine, those were released timed with the arrival of Hochstein also. Uh, so, you know, he is the face of Zionism, the imperial face of Zionism in Lebanon. And uh, he has, of course, a lot of minions. Uh, you know, the, the, the Americans invested in, in a lot of politicians. Uh, but a lot of those politicians have been very, very quiet, especially since the uh, cyber terrorist attack. Uh, maybe there's a few politicians that call themselves um, change politicians that uh, have been loud, uh, but the rest, because of the public feelings on the street, are too scared to say something. And especially knowing now at this moment, they know this is even look, even house slaves know if uh, the master is going to burn down the whole house, that they're going to go down with it. They're going to burn inside the house in the kitchen. So if there's an attack on Lebanon, if there's a war on Lebanon, it will not discriminate. The Zionist blew up the port of Beirut purposefully, knowing that the neighborhood just beside it is a Christian neighborhood. They are willing to sacrifice those. And beside the port of Beirut is the head office of the Kata'ib party, the Falange, the, the Christian supremacists were genociders that committed the, uh, the Sabra and Shatila massacre that we're just commemorating uh, yesterday uh, or a few days ago. Sorry. I'm, I'm... So uh, those are, the West is willing to sacrifice them. The Zionists are willing to burn them with the rest of Lebanon. And this is why you now they are quiet. Interesting. That's, that's a big change. It seems. Um, my my follow up to this is something you touched on earlier. Is Hezbollah's response? It seems like um, over the last twenty four hours, Hezbollah has carried out maybe twenty operations in response to this bombing this morning, as well as the um, the Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, communications massacres. Could you speak to, um, you know, more about Hezbollah's response to these events and the previous events, uh, also the Arba'in operation, um, yeah, whatever you want to share on that. Yeah, all of those are connected together, of course, the Arba'in operation being uh, the retaliation for the assassination of uh, General Shukur in Beirut, as well as uh, chief of staff. And uh, in that operation, Hezbollah destroyed the headquarters of the Aman, the Israeli military intelligence, and specifically the building that hosts uh, Unit 8200, responsible for all the electronic and uh, warfare um, of the Zionist colony. And uh, that includes, you know, targeting for assassination uh, using, uh, you know, tracking of electronics and so forth. And uh, that led to what we were told is the resignation of the head of Unit 8200. Uh, in my opinion, he's dead, uh, and we will never see him again. He hasn't, been seen, he hasn't been seen publicly. Hezbollah claims that they liquidated at least 30 of it, members of uh, the, the Aman and Unit 8200. Um, and uh, thus, the response to the attack on the electronic warfare a unit of the Zionist and uh, the targeting of their military um, intelligence, a man agency, we saw the Israelis using specifically electronic warfare in their genocidal attack at the beginning of the week on the electronics in those two days. And that shows you also a clear fingerprint of this is actually who did this uh, action. And uh, I would say the coming firing of the Minister of Defense of the Zionist colony was about this response, this agreement uh, about this, this response from Netanyahu and the, you know, Ben Giver's uh, kind of uh, wanted 
this genocidal, vicious, uh, useless tactically or strategically attack, other than being a terrorism act that is designed to terrorize the population and the world, the whole world has been terrorized uh, because of the actions and nobody now feels safe with any electronics that come from the West, no matter what. Uh, everybody's worried that their laptop or their cell phone is going to blow up on them now because it's damn Mac or, or some PC from the West. So um, Hezbollah has yet to uh, actually begin its response against the uh, cyber terrorism attack. What we saw is that the Zionists rushed because Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah said this is going to be a method, methodic action that is going to be a, a just punishment that is going to be coming from a place that the Zionists cannot even predict and that he will not say anything more than that and that only the tightest uh, circle within Hezbollah, probably the top five people are the ones that are going to know how and when and why uh, are, are, are going to be in the know. This is why the Israelis immediately, starting last night, began a huge military campaign. So, uh, you know, in the uh, around the dawn hours, the Israelis conducted a, over 100 air raids on the south, uh, meaning they, they, you know, uh, dedicated the majority of their air force to to conduct such attacks and uh, um, this led to Hezbollah immediately responding in kind and has since uh, dawn and since last night fired uh, now close to a thousand missiles this is the most missiles we've seen fired uh, you know, in a in a situation like this, and it's still continuing. And Hezbollah has targeted the main uh, artillery headquarters for the Zionist military in uh, the occupied Sierra and Golan, and the headquarters uh, in the north of Palestine of the uh, Israeli military intelligence. A man in the Safad. Uh, just beside Tabariya Lake or uh, Sea of Galilee in English and has pounded them hour after hour. So we're talking about total destruction of these bases. Uh, this is above and beyond all the other attacks. You Up until now, uh, Hezbollah has claimed almost 20, I think, uh, waves of attacks since the morning. And now with the destruction of this neighborhood in Lahia, basically, we are expecting this night to be uh, hotter and hotter, and we'll see what happens. Um, we may wake up to a full of war. So, can we, I mean, yeah, that's understandable. Oh, this was, I mean, this was, uh, this was to happen some time or other. So it has come. It seems that the war has come. To Lebanon, I mean, even if Hezbollah might have wanted it not to, especially to its population, not the country in general. So if we, um, I mean, since you have touched on the sectarianism within the Lebanese society or within Lebanon, uh, let's also talk a bit about the sectarianism that my friend mentioned about the other other neighbors, the other neighbors of Palestine, Lebanon, etc., in the region. So, of course, there are the pro-resistance ones like you have Syria and Iran, and then you have, for example, I mean, not just the the fake kingdoms. I'm not just only talking about uh, Saudi Arabia, etc., but especially Qatar, which has tried to sell its uh, sell itself. Let us sell its image, they create an image of a mediator doing this sort of mediation between Hamas and with uh, other, other Palestinian factions with the Zionist entity, etc., trying to bring about a ceasefire or whatever they say. So how do you view the role of Qatar, especially Qatar, which is which tries to set itself as something different from Saudi Arabia or UAE? And then how do you also assess the role of Syria? in counter position or Iran, especially given that Iran has a recently sort of change of government with a sort of more moderate president who seems to have some pro-Western bias also. 
Well, there's a lot to cover there. Um, one, Qatar is a snake, um, the government. Um, people are nice everywhere, but everybody has to understand, like, uh, you know, the creation of Qatar. Qatar was, you know, 40,000 people when it was created. It's not even one block. When similarly, like Bahrain was around that same kind of population in the 1970s when they were created fake countries they were not even city states they were one block states okay and uh you know you have a ruling family in qatar there's actually not even from qatar they are from najd they are part a branch of the saud family that were imported by the british and made to rule over the qatari people the few other families that were in this land before it was made into a state. Uh, similarly with the Bahraini ruling family. Okay, these are imported uh, royals from the Saudi uh, branches of the Saud family. Uh, and of course, there is no such thing as Saudi people, I wanna say. Uh, there's Arabian people, there's Najdis, there's Hijazis. Uh, you know, the, the Saud family is, it's like call, you know saying there's Saudi Arabia or Saudi people is like saying there's Windsorians when we say it, instead of saying British or English and uh, Windsorian peoples, right? And uh, this is a curse on the uh, on the proud Arabian peoples uh, to have the name of this cursed family forced on them. Um, um, okay, so. No, they're, they're, Qatar is playing the role of a spy, of the you know propaganda arm that keeps everybody in check, but it's allowed a space to uh, kind of pretend to be uh, pitiful of the Palestinian people, but not really supportive of the resistance. Uh, Syria, Syria is the backbone of the resistance. Without Syria, there will be no weapons delivered in Gaza. There will be no weapons delivered to Lebanon. Without Syria, those weapons that we are seeing in Gaza uh, being used, those weapons that are homemade in Gaza wouldn't be built because the Syrian military and the Syrian state uh, smuggled whole factories machineries into Gaza for it to be able to uh, build, you know, build these and manufacture these weapons that can sustain them on a ground war as we see. Those uh, uh, you know, anti-tank missiles wouldn't be built without the machineries of Syria that were smuggled in uh, and continue to be smuggled in. The weapons and Machineries are continuing to be smuggled in right now from Syria. And so uh, Syria is definitely the backbone, uh, the quiet backbone right now, because it is also Syria is under uh, direct occupation by three uh, parts of the imperial uh, state. You have Syria and Golan, occupied by the Zionists directly, overlooking Damascus just under. Uh, it's less than you know, 20 minutes from the Golan Heights to Damascus. People don't understand. Uh, and uh, the US occupying the northeast and Turkey in the northwest, that's a pincer. Uh, this is the only reason that Syria is not responding because the whole axis of resistance knows that the West wants to make Syria a battlefield. They had an, an itch and an urge to do that more than they wanted for Lebanon, the whole West, because they know that if you destroy Syria and you take out the Syrian government and the Syrian military, then you cut the whole supply on Hezbollah, and that will be a much easier war to fight Hezbollah without a supply line, you see? So uh, we should all be blessing Syria and uh, counting the half a million Syrians that died in the last decade or so as martyrs on the road to, the, to Jerusalem, on the road to the liberation of Palestine. 
their sacrifices and the sacrifices of the Syrian military that kept at bay the hordes of the Wahhabi death cult that the Americans in the West unleashed on it uh, and, and have, have saved humanity. The courage and support of the Iranians and the Hezbollah during that war, can you imagine if those 200,000 Wahhabi death cult members were not minced in the, in the fields of Syria and were free to roam after? I think, look at Russia is just dealing with a small portion of the leftovers of those Wahhabi mercenaries that are fighting on the front lines of Ukraine. Imagine if they were all alive today. Um, and Iran, Iran doesn't have a, now does not have actually a moderate or closer to the West um, president. I, I assure you. I think, uh, I, I, I personally believe that President Raisi was assassinated by the Zionist and the West. And uh, that put Iran in a really hard situation. Uh, and uh, what they decided to do is bring kind of an Obama face uh, into power. Okay. And, you know, just to be clear, there is no such thing as democracy in the West or in the East. I don't want to be joking about that. And uh, the same theatrics that the West did to put in the face of Obama as a minority on the, on the seat of power uh, to be able to enable them to commit uh, invasion of seven countries, uh, Obama's wars. Currently, Iran was very smart to purposefully elect a Azerbaijani Iranian, okay? from the province where Raisi was assassinated, okay? And he's a doctor, but he is now with him, his presence, now you have a unified uh, in euphoria kind of country, just like that euphoria that the US masses were swept in with Obama and uh, that allowed Obama to commit all those crimes. Now. The state of Iran, when it is forced into a war led by Bazakhshkian, the whole country is going to be behind him. He represented all, not only the Azerbaijanis, by him he's the first to be non-Persian -Ir Iranian to be the president. This, he speaks for all the various, basically, minorities within Iran. And so this was a very smart, very smart uh, act by the establishment in Iran that has uh, solidified the state in preparations for uh, any confrontations that are going to come. Wow. So that, that, that is an interesting take on what happened in Iran. Of course, I also believe that Raisi was killed. I mean, most I think most people believe that. So uh, yeah, that this take is very interesting because on the on at least publicly um, the president current president of Iran has expressed that well he wants to go back to the nuclear deal and etc wants uh, China and Russia to support the nuclear deal as they had done before etc so it was on the face it would look like he has some pro western anyway so what i was going to talk about particularly i'm i'm just going to ask you about the propaganda because you mentioned the Qatari propaganda, and you mentioned Syria, and it's that most people outside Syria, and not just the West, but elsewhere, because I'm not in the West, and I know that most people outside the West do not really, I mean, outside Syria, do not really know the, the importance of Syria, the current Syrian government, or, or the importance in general, or that, that it is occupied, like a third of the country is occupied, or that it is also under like more than 1,000 unilateral coercive measures by the United States, the European Union and their vessels. So all these things like have been sort of, let's say there has been a blackout on this mostly in media. 
done by anti-Syria propaganda coming from, I would say, Qatar. And I'll especially mention Al Jazeera, which people, many people uphold as a, as a source of knowledge from, for the resistance, to talking about the Palestinian resistance. So how do you assess the role of Al Jazeera as a, as a propaganda arm of the Qatari regime? Yeah, I mean, definitely it is currently the most successful arm of the whole imperial uh, propaganda machine. It, it ha, you know, because all the other main media outlets under control of the empire, from the BBC to whatever you have, have humiliated themselves so badly by out and out uh, being supporting of genocide that... Uh, now, the majority of their own populations in those countries don't see their own media, mass media, as trustworthy. Uh, and so currently, Al Jazeera is providing the same service that it did uh, to the empire uh, before the quote-unquote Arab Spring uh, on this English side on its English channel. On its Arabic channel, it's, it's, uh, it has lost its credibility since the Arab autumn. It used to have close to 500 million viewers uh, in the Arabic world. Uh, you know, we're talking about 80 somewhat percent of the population was watching them on the Arabic station. Today, there's less than 8 million viewers for Al Jazeera Arabic. Because Al Jazeera Arabic you know, uh, burnt itself as the vessel of uh, the Wahhabi and and Khwani uh, death marches across the, the Arabic world. Uh, and now the English uh, uh, arm of Al Jazeera is playing that same role within the Western population. Okay, it is keeping the population within of uh, the limitations of what is acceptable speech on every file other than Palestine, right? So it is pro-Ukraine, it's anti-Syria, it's anti-Venezuela, it's anti-anybody and everybody that is the, the empire hates except Palestine. And that's what it did before the Arab autumn in the Arabic side. It capitalized and was allowed by the empire to capitalize on Palestine in order to keep hold of the masses uh, uh, in, in the imperial order. So this is their role and they will continue to be uh, such. Uh, there's no such thing as Qatar as a state. Uh, and anyone that thinks that the Amir in Qatar or whatever has any say in how his country or his propaganda arm is, is being used is, is, is uh, delusional. Yeah. I like to personally refer to uh, Al Jazeera as the, uh, the media arm of Al Udai Air Base. Um, it's the largest air base and it's right next to their capital. And for some reason, nobody seems to mention it, especially not Al Jazeera mentioning the hundreds and hundreds of U.S. cargo planes that have been used to fly weapons of extermination into occupied Palestine from Al Udaid Air Base, you know, not five kilometers from the headquarters of Al Jazeera. Um, I guess, so as a follow-up to this, um, th there's two things I want to ask you about before we're done here. One is your role with Free Palestine TV as a, a genuinely pro-resistance uh, anti-imperialist news outlet focusing on English language media, and if you could talk about that. And the other thing I want to make sure that we discuss too is um, the transformation, like what is happening with Gaza and the transformation of Hamas under um, Yahya al-Sinwar and after, you know, the cowardly assassination of Ismail Haniyeh. And you know, whether that and, and how that might relate to the relationship of Hamas with Qatar, if there was, you know, I mean, we know there was some relationship, they were sending money, you know, the headquarters are obviously there. Um, and how we see, how you see the future of the battle that is happening in Gaza between this horrific extermination that we see every day and the 
incredible bravery and, and tactical achievements that are also happening every day by the resistance. So that's that's two things uh, I would like to hear on both aspects if you have time. Yeah, yeah. So starting with Free Palestine TV, um, we're trying to fill a huge gap in the English media content, uh, specifically from areas that are not covered in the mainstream and or even in the social media. Uh, so definitely Lebanon and South Lebanon, where we started the coverage uh, of uh, had very little uh, reporting coming out of it. We found ourselves a lot of times when we were in South Lebanon uh, to be the only English media or international media at any locations. And uh, it, lately, since uh, the end of August, we launched our um, field reporting from the West Bank. We were there for the invasion of Janine, uh, Hebron, and many other locations. Uh, we currently have uh, seven reporters in the on the ground in the West Bank uh, and uh, um, you know many here in Lebanon it's a smaller crew here but uh, this is our aim is to show not the only the reality but also show these perseverance of the people there's a lot of videos out there of uh, genocide um, and uh, at the same time, we are doing um, English translation of all the operational videos of the resistance access. Um, so you can find on our uh, channels translation of all those videos, including the hood hood videos and other videos, everything that's coming out uh, from all the factions uh, in the resistance on the ground in Palestine, in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, in, in Yemen. Uh, and finally, we're doing um, in-depth shows uh, like uh, Wartime Cafe that interviews uh, personalities and thinkers uh, here in Lebanon in English and uh, uh, Prisoners of War uh, interviewing former Palestinian POWs in the West Bank, uh, those, uh, and, and we have much more planned. This work is uh, practically voluntary. Uh, you know, everybody that's involved is, uh, uh, you know, um, other than me, very young. Uh, they're young people in that we're trying to, uh, you know, train and, and do, uh, create the empowerment that that comes with. And, uh, give them the space to create and show the world uh, what their communities are going through. Uh, and, um, you know, we're depending on donations, but given that right now we're doing so much translation work, so much subtitling work, so much uh, production work above and beyond all the reporting on the ground and all the shows, uh, the equipment needs, the uh, all of that is is uh, you know requiring us to ask for bigger donations right now. We're asking people to go to our website, free Palestine video, subscribe, either give us a nice donation or subscribe for a monthly donation of at least ten dollars. Uh, we're trying to uh, increase the production scales, and as this war um, expands. Uh, it's going to become harder and harder to get the news from the ground. And it's going to become harder and harder for us to even reach the funds that you're donating uh, as viewers. So this is a, a crucial time for us to get donations. Uh, you can follow us on all the sites. Uh, we've had all, almost, uh, you know, just over 7 million views in five months on all our uh, platforms uh, we're starting to feel the heat they just shut down our instagram um and I we opened that. the second yeah we opened the second one uh, hopefully that one will last um i don't know and and uh, some of the videos on youtube uh interviews with pow's or the uh, wartime cafe uh, interview with a member of parliament here ibrahim and musawi who represents uh the block of um, um, Hezbollah, 
uh, was also taken down. Um, and so, you know, we are under repression. Uh, I've been getting death threats online and offline, uh, you know, and uh, our team in South Lebanon, um, you know, was narrowly escaped a bombing me and, and had the Hutit, the camera person that was with me, two missiles fell beside us a few months ago. Uh, they were targeted to us. Uh, so, and our teams in the West Bank right now are getting threats. Uh, so, you know, this work is revolutionary work. And just like the rest of the journalists in Lebanon and Palestine were all under threat. Uh, and so uh, we hope that, uh, you know, all the content that we're producing, uh, you know, uh, appeases our viewers and, and we can get more donations. Thank you for everything that you all do. It's very, very important work. We saw that, uh, we saw that you survived that bombing. Uh, we saw about when your previous headquarters, I guess, were raided and been watching some videos where um, the folks in the West Bank are getting shot at. So um, hopefully you all can stay safe and continue doing this revolutionary work. Um, do you all only accept uh, donations with uh, this, this service? I'm on your website right now. Um, yeah, there is uh, PayPal and Stripe. Yeah, it's a donor box thing and um, you can pay, use PayPal, uh, Stripe, uh, Google Pay, Apple Pay, whatever you, uh, and, and or direct, um, I think, bank. Uh, the other thing is that you can pay in any currency. So there's a drop down menu and you can choose how often and what's the number that you want to donate, if it's one time or monthly or what have you. Okay, so PayPal has not yet shut you down because it has been shutting down Palestinian Palestinians and then it also threatened us. I mean, it was not threat, but it seemed like one, it sent us a mail that asking us all sorts of weird questions that had nothing to do with the Renogo Tribune, but anyway. So still, until now, we are still there, but we don't know. So we, uh, the empire is trying to close in from all sides. Uh, okay, so it's, you have mentioned your television and other things. So in this in this situation, I would actually like to ask you about, especially about television and Palestine, I mean, media and Palestine especially. So over the last year, we have seen that resistance media in, on social media, Telegram, etc. There's a resistance media outlets have grown a lot. Like they have grown exponentially compared to the previous war times. So what do you think about this resistance media's role in shaping the mindset of the Arab people or maybe changing the mindset in association with the Palestinian cause as well as that of the international masses? Well, look, um, let me be very truthful here. If there is no valiant Palestinian resistance and access of resistance in general, valiant actions by them, uh, if there wasn't a steadfast Palestinian people under genocide uh, and there wasn't uh, Palestinians filming us on the ground, the truth as it happens, and showing us those horrible uh, genocide images. If it wasn't for the brilliant resistance media producers, and I mean here the military resistance medias of Hamas, Hezbollah, and others that are packaging for us those amazing images of destruction of the prowess of the Western military might hmm, on a daily basis, nothing else would have mattered. So I believe the most important media achievement has not been by any TV station and or any social media account or blog based in Chicago or there or so on. If there was no on the ground 
Palestinian people willing to do this media work for us to see all of it and those brilliant uh, military media productions, none of us will be talking about this today. There will be, wouldn't have been anything to share. It would have been uh, a genocide in the silence. We our, our population would have been demoralized without those amazing resistance videos coming out, produced and packaged for us from somebody in a bunker three kilometers underground that hasn't seen the sun in 11 months, right? So let's not pat ourselves on the back. I know my place. I honestly know my place. I know what I have contributed. And uh, honestly, uh, the mass, or let's say the alternative media, I hate even that term, the progressive media, the uh, revolutionary media in the, that is based in the West, uh, has, although it has done good, it looks like it's done great. Uh, this is the least we should be expecting from it under the amazing conditions of the original product that is being produced on the ground of the battlefield. Uh, but what is um, really disturbing to see in how our media uh, has, has uh, behaved is that we haven't seen any uh, innovation there's innovation on the ground by the military media arms of the resistance. There's innovation on the ground by the Palestinian civilians and the Lebanese civilians. Our media has not innovated. In fact, so nobody thinks that I'm just bashing on the West-based uh, media or our leftist media across the world. Uh, the axis of resistance media arms like press TV or whatever you want, you know, others have, in my opinion, failed. Hmm? Again, nobody watches them. Nobody, it is those Palestinians that are on the ground that made a difference. And, uh, and thus, when I look at, uh, you know, progressive media based in the West, I see that they have benefited from the sacrifices of the media producer on the ground of the battlefield. And uh, they themselves have not innovated. I have, you know, we have a plethora of projects across from one ocean to another, hundreds of websites, each dealing with a different part of the thing and one doing text, one doing audio, one doing video. I haven't seen any mass media coming out of this? Why can't a revolutionary moment like this bring innovation? Why don't I see a new TV station? I'm trying to start a TV station. <laughs> yes, I call it Free Palestine TV and I, currently I'm not, we're not able to produce uh, other than these reports from the ground and these uh, TV uh, format shows, but I want it to be a 24 hour news station. TV station that can be a tsunami of information that floods the enemy. Nobody within our progressive media in the in the West or not has arisen to that challenge, and people see that as this work as uh, as, as as a waste of time because they are benefiting from the wave coming from the ground. On in Gaza and other places in the battlefield. That's a lot to think about. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's a necessary criticism that we don't that we don't see, and it's a, a lot for us to reflect on to the Arnold Tribune. So thank you for sharing that. It's very true. My final question for you is that. People kind of around the world, even in the Arab world, seem to believe that the liberation of Palestine comes at the push of a button. 
there'll be one major strike and you know if they just do this you know the curtains of history will fly open and um obviously that's not the case and there's reasons why that narrative is pushed um but what do you see as the path to victory for the resistance in this war um, for the liberation of palestine and for the liberation of all of west asia from atlanto-zionist american occupation Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah addressed this in his speech yesterday. And, uh, you know, anyone that wants to understand the kind of struggle that we're fighting in Palestine uh, could listen to Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah. And, uh, but the gist of it is that the Palestinian struggle is a decolonization struggle. And decolonization uh, struggles are long uh, require a huge amount of sacrifice and uh, given that decolonization struggles usually are of an indigenous population that is uh, over over matched in power and uh, financing by its imperial or colonial occupier the only path forward usually for the decolonization people is to uh, have a war of attrition that uh, the main goal of it is not uh, to win at a moment but to frustrate the your your occupiers your colonizers uh, efforts you win by not letting them win and you by dragging it on and this is what ha happened in Algeria this is what happened in Vietnam this is what happened in South Africa this is the only way forward in the situation we cannot lie to ourselves and say we can match uh, the empire in an all-out war okay yes the resistance and the whole axis of resistance has shown us glorious days, has shown us innovations militarily, technologically, and all of that. But we are not the empire of white supremacy that spans this planet and all of its that can print money at will and, and uh, uh, rain a, a nuclear holocaust on top of you in a minute. So rationally, in order not to have the empire reign a nuclear holocaust on you by doing a, a all out one all at once attack on the Zionist colony from all sides by all the and then all the West claiming, oh the Arabs, we've been telling you since 1948, wanna throw the Jews in the sea, right? And then all of them raining their nuclear weapons on us. You see, this is where uh, emotions of people that all of us are emotional, of course, because we're watching this genocide, but that doesn't, should not, on the one hand, frustrate people and make them think that we're losing this war. No, we're winning it. There hasn't been one tactical, let alone strategic goal that the Zionists have, that they have achieved since October 7. Not even tactical achievements. And day after day, it is the resistance that is scoring tactical achievements. We haven't reached the strategic goal of a total liberation of Palestine. That's not the aim yet. The aim is to frustrate every tactical maneuver that your enemy has in, a, this, in this decolonization struggle. And we're already seeing how this is forcing the Zionists to expose themselves and the West to expose themselves more and more and more as bloodthirsty uh, crusaders, Jew-saders, hordes, uh, pirates and bandits, uh, road bandits and, and rapists and child killers. They are being forced to do that because of the strategic patience of the axis of resistance. And I, 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 you asked one question before, and I, I'm going to have to let you go, guys, after this. But you asked a question that I forgot to answer, Dalal. 
and it was about Sinwar. And uh, just to say, uh, Qatar has no say anymore now in what Hamas is doing. They've lost control completely. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, the election of Sinwar as a response to the assassination of the kind soul, uh, Ismail Haniye, uh, means uh, that uh, Sinwar was not only the military leader, not only the political leader inside Gaza, but also uh, was the head of the political borough of all of Hamas, meaning uh, Khalid Mash'al and any of the Hamas uh, members that were housed in Qadar for decades and, and comfortable there, lost any say and have only uh, Sinwar is the one that is now uh, has a say in the negotiations. So there's no in-betweens, there's nobody to, to, to uh, lobby, there's nobody to pressure. And he's under the ground in Gaza with his people and he will not come out until victory or of the West uh, stepping down from the tree and ending the genocide in Gaza, which I doubt will happen. Okay, so I, th I think that that point on uh, people, I mean, emotion not taking over rationality is very important because uh, we have received messages from many people um, who read our stuff and uh, follow in general uh, resistance media, etc. They're like, uh, why doesn't Hezbollah go all out in war with uh, Zionists? And I mean, this this has been a question actually for all war fronts and uh, we have to understand i mean you said that uh, the empire can kill you if you would do that so you have to preserve yourself and at the same time drag out the war as much as possible with i mean be patient so that so that you don't say i mean if we live then anything is possible so that's the most important thing and uh, I, so thanks for pointing that out especially you being where you are, doing what you do. So I think, uh, yeah, as you said, this will be a good place to close. And I thank, thank you very much for coming, uh, despite the situation. Mm, I mean, I, I was under the impression that we would have lost one or something. But anyway, so thanks a lot. We'll, we follow Free Palestine TV. I mean, we try to follow it. And apart from that, is there any other place where we can find your work? So if you would say that. Yeah, we are on TikTok at TV Free Palestine. We're in, on Instagram. We're on Rumble. We're on YouTube. Uh, we are on um, Telegram. Much more. Telegram. Yes, yes. And you can find all our socials uh, on our link tree, uh, link tree Free Palestine TV. So um, that, that you, all the connections are there. Okay, so thank you very much, and thanks a lot to Dalal. Um, and uh, well, we 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 will we will wait until Palestine is free and the whole Arab world is free, because uh, I mean, yeah, when Palestine is free, then the when the whole region will be free, and colonization will I mean the Sykes Pico and the colonization from that time will be dead, not just in that region but also in Asia, because for all over Asia that exists. So thanks a lot to you for coming and thanks a lot to Dalal for accompanying this uh, interview.